Spring and Autumn Period Jian, Warring States Jian, Qin Dynasty Jins, Han Dynasty Jian, Ming Dynasty Jian, Qing Dynasty Jian Historically, all Chinese swords are classified into two types, Jian and Dao. Jins are double-edged straight swords while Daos are single-edged, and mostly curved from the Song Dynasty forward. The Jian has been translated at times as a long sword, and the Dao a saber or a knife. Bronze jins appeared during the Western Zhou period and switched to wrought iron and steel during the late Warring States period. In modern times, the ceremonial commissioned officers sort of the Chinese navy has been patterned after the traditional Jian since 2008. Other than specialized weapons like the divided Dao, Chinese swords are usually 70 to 110 centimeters in length, although longer swords have been found on occasion. Outside of China, Chinese swords were also used in Japan from the 3rd to the 6th century AD, but were replaced with Korean and native Japanese swords by the Middle Heian era. Jian of Yue King Zezi Yu Yi Sword of Hello of Wu Late Spring and Autumn Period Spear and Sword Close-Up of Sword Pattern Ornate Sword Hilts from the Spring and Autumn Period Knives were found in Fu Hao's Tomb, dated c. 1200 BC. Bronze jins appeared during the Western Zhou. The blades were a mere 28 to 46 centimeters long. These short stabbing weapons were used as a last defense when all other options had failed. By the late spring and autumn period, jins lengthened to about 56 centimeters. At this point at least some soldiers used the jian rather than the dagger axe due to its greater flexibility and portability. China started producing steel in the 6th century BC, but it was not until later on that iron and steel implements were produced in useful amounts. By around 500 BC however the sword and shield combination began to be regarded as superior to the spear and dagger axe. The early bronze swords are seldom over about 50 centimeters in length, and are sometimes referred to as short swords. A rather sudden development, perhaps in the mid-3rd century BC, is the bronze long sword, typically about a meter long. An example, from the first emperor's mausoleum. Most iron swords are also long, and the development of the long bronze sword is often considered to be related to the development of the long iron sword. Donald Wagner according to the Yue Jue Shu, the swordsmith Yu Yeji forged five treasured swords for Gan Zhang and King Zhao of Chu, named, respectively, Zanlu, Juke, Shengxi, Yuchong and Chunjin. He also made three swords for King Gujian of Yue, named Long Yuan, Tai and Gongbu. Among the names of ancient swords are Zanlu and Yuchong. The character is pronounced John. The name Zanlu, refers to its clear, John John Ran, black color. Lu means black. The ancients used Ji steel, see below, to make the edge and wrought iron to make the haft, jing, and trunk, don, i, e, the spine. Otherwise they would often snap. In swords made of steel the edge is often damaged, and this is the origin of the name juke, great notch. Thus one cannot use Ji steel by itself. Yu Chong, fish gut was what today is called a pangang, coiled steel, or songwen, fur-patterned, sword. If one takes a fish, bakes it, and strips off the ribs to reveal the guts, it has a distinct resemblance to the pattern on a modern pangang sword. Shen Kuo according to the spring and autumn annals of Wu and Yue, Yueji was also the teacher of Gan Zhang, who was married to Mo Yi. King Helu of Wu ordered Gan Zhang and Mo Yi to forge a pair of swords for him in three months. However, the blast furnace failed to melt the metal. Mo Yi suggested that there was insufficient human chi in the furnace so the couple cut their hair and nails and cast them into the furnace, while 300 children helped to blow air into the bellows. In another account, Mo Yi sacrificed herself to increase human chi by throwing herself into the furnace. The desired result was achieved after three years and the resulting two swords were named after the couple. Gan Zhang kept the male sword, Gan Zhang, for himself and presented the female sword, Moi, of the pair to the king. The king, Already upset that Gan Zhang had failed to supply the swords in three months, but three years, became enraged when he discovered the smith had kept the male sword, and thus had Gan Zhang killed. Gan Zhang had already predicted the king's reaction, so he left behind a message for Mo Yi and their unborn son telling them where he had hidden the Gan Zhang sword. Several months later, Mo Yi gave birth to Gan Zhang's son, Qi, and years later she told him his father's story. Qi was eager to avenge his father and he sought the Gan Zhang sword. At the same time, the king dreamed of a youth who desired to kill him and placed a bounty on the youth's head. She was indignant and, filled with anguish, he started crying on his way to enact his vengeance. An assassin found Chi, who told the assassin his story. The assassin then suggested that Chi surrender his head and sword, and the assassin himself will avenge Gan Zhang in Chi's place. 
He did as told and committed suicide. The assassin was moved and decided to help Chi fulfill his quest. The assassin severed Chi's head and brought it, along with the Ganjong sword to the overjoyed king. The king was however uncomfortable with Chi's head staring at him, and the assassin asked the king to have Chi's head boiled, but Chi's head was still staring at the king even after 40 days without any sign of decomposition. Thus the assassin told the king that he needed to take a closer look and stare back in order for the head to decompose under the power of the king. The king bent over the cauldron and the assassin seized the opportunity to decapitate him, his head falling into the cauldron alongside Chi's. The assassin then cut off his own head, which also fell into the boiling water. The flesh on the heads was boiled away such that none of the guards could recognize which head belonged to whom. The guards and vassals decided that all three should be honored as kings due to Chi and the assassin's bravery and loyalty. The three heads were eventually buried together at Yichen County, Runan, Hanan, and the grave is called Tomb of Three Kings. Iron and steel swords of 80 to 100 centimeters in length appeared during the mid-warring states period in the states of Chu, Han, and Yan. The majority of weapons were still made of bronze but iron and steel weapons were starting to become more common. By the end of the 3rd century BC, the Chinese had learned how to produce quench-hardened steel swords, relegating bronze swords to ceremonial pieces. The John Guose states that the state of Han made the best weapons, capable of cleaving through the strongest armor, shields, leather boots and helmets. During the Warring States period, the Beiyue people were known for their swordsmanship and producing fine swords. According to the Spring and Autumn Annals of Wu and Yue, King Dujian met a female sword fighter called Nanlin who demonstrated mastery over the art, and so he commanded his top five commanders to study her technique. Ever since, the technique came to be known as the Sword of the Lady of Yue. The Yue were also thought to have possessed mystical knives imbued with the talismanic power of dragons or other amphibious creatures. The woman was going to travel north to have audience with King, Gujian of Yue, when she met an old man on the road, and he introduced himself as Lord Yuan. He asked the woman, I have heard that you are good at swordsmanship, I would like to see this. E woman said, I do not dare to conceal anything from you, my lord. You may put me to the test. Lord Yuan then selected a stave of Linyu bamboo, the top of which was withered. He broke off, the leaves, at the top and threw them to the ground, and the woman picked them up, before they hit the ground. Lord Yuan then grabbed the bottom end of the bamboo and stabbed at the woman. She responded, and they fought three bouts, and just as the woman lifted the stave to strike him, Lord Yuan flew into the treetops and became a white gibbon. Spring and Autumn Annals of Wu and Yue The John Guose mentions the high quality of southern swords and their ability to cleave through oxen, horses, bowls, and basins, but would shatter if used on a pillar or rock. Wu and Yue swords were highly valued and those who owned them would hardly ever use them for fear of damage, however in Wu and Yue these swords were commonplace and treated with less reverence. The Yue Jue Shu mentions several named swords, Sanlu, Hokao, Juke, Luton, Chunjin, Shengxi, Yuchang, Longyuan, Tai, and Gongbu. Many of these were made by the Yue swordsmith Wu Yeji. Swords held a special place in the culture of the ancient kingdoms of Wu and Yue. Legends about swords were recorded here far earlier and in much greater detail than any other part of China, and this reflects both the development of sophisticated sword-making technology in this region of China. And the importance of these blades within the culture of the ancient South. Both Wu and Yue were famous among their contemporaries for the quantity and quality of the blades that they produced, but it was not until much later, during the Han Dynasty, that legends about them were first collected. These tales became an important part of Chinese mythology, and introduced the characters of legendary swordsmiths such as Gan Zhang and Mo Yi to new audiences in stories that would be popular for millennia. These tales would serve to keep the fame of Wu and Yue swordcraft alive, many centuries after these kingdoms had vanished, and indeed into a time when swords had been rendered completely obsolete for other than ceremonial purposes by developments in military technology. Olivia Milburn even after Wu and Yue was assimilated into larger Chinese polities, memory of their swords lived on. During the Han Dynasty, Lu Pai King of Wu had a sword named Vujian to honor the history of metalworking in his kingdom. Warring State Sword Guard sword dances are first mentioned shortly after the end of the Qin Dynasty. Swords up to 110 cm in length began to appear. Han Dynasty Jins. The longest is 146 cm in length. Han Dynasty Steel and Bronze Swords Han Jian and Scabbard Han Jian and Scabbard the Jian was mentioned as one of the five weapons during the Han Dynasty, the other four being Dao, Spear, Halberd, and Staff. 
Another version of the five weapons lists the bow and crossbow as one weapon, the Jian and Dao as one weapon, in addition to halberd, shield, and armor. The Jian was a popular weapon during the Han era and there emerged a class of swordsmen who made their living through fencing. Sword fencing was also a popular pastime for aristocrats. A 37-chapter manual known as the Way of the Jian is known to have existed, but is no longer extant. South and Central China were said to have produced the best swordsmen. Han Dynasty swords produced between the 1st and 2nd centuries AD have been found in Japan, a ring pommel dao with an inscription 30-fold refined and a jian with the inscription 50-fold refined. A jian in Nara Prefecture was also found with an inscription saying it was produced in the Thongping era and hundredfold. Refined. There existed a weapon called the horse beheading jian, so-called because it was supposedly able to cut off a horse's head. However, another source says that it was an execution tool used on special occasions rather than a military weapon. As far as we are aware today, all the ancient Chinese iron swords were of wrought iron or steel, none were cast. It seems clear enough that a competent smith could make a wrought iron or steel sword of any reasonable length that the customer desired or could pay for. Lengths in the range 70 to 100 centimeters seem to be most common, thus swords as long as 1. 2 meters and even 1. 4 meters are known. The longer length of an iron sword must have given a warrior an immediate advantage over one with a short bronze sword. Donald Wagner Deus with ring pommels also became widespread as a cavalry weapon during the Han era. The Dao had the advantage of being single-edged, which meant the dull side could be thickened to strengthen the sword, making it less prone to breaking. When paired with a shield, the Dao made for a practical replacement for the Jian, hence it became the more popular choice as time went on. After the Han, sword dances using the Dao rather than the Jian are mentioned to have occurred. Archaeological samples range from 86 to 114 centimeters in length. An account of Duan Jiang's tactical formation in 167 AD specifies that he arranged three ranks of halberds, swordsmen and spearmen. Supported by crossbows, with light cavalry on each wing. Jin Dynasty Dao swords of idiosyncratic sizes are mentioned. One individual named Chen apparently wielded a great sword over two meters in length. Sun Quan's wife had over a hundred female attendants armed with daos. By the end of the Three Kingdoms the Dao had completely overtaken the Jian as the primary close combat weapon. The lighter and less durable double-edged Jian entered the domain of court dancers, officials, and expert warriors. Suai Dynasty Swords in the 6th century, Kwaimu Wai Wen introduced to Northern Qi the process of co-fusion steelmaking, which used metals of different carbon contents to create steel. Apparently, Deos made using this method were capable of penetrating 30 armor lamella. It's not clear if the armor was of iron or leather. Wai Wen made sabers, Dao, of overnight iron, Sutai. His method was to anneal, Shao, powdered cast iron, Sheng Tai Jing, with layers of soft, iron, blanks, ding, presumably thin plates. After several days the result is steel, gang. Soft iron was used for the spine of the saber, he washed it in the urine of the five sacrificial animals and quench hardened it in the fat of the five sacrificial animals, such a saber, could penetrate thirty armor lamella, ja. The overnight soft blanks, su ruting, cast today, in the suai period? By the metallurgists of Shango represent a vestige of, kwai vu wai wen's, technique. The sabers which they make are still extremely sharp, but they cannot penetrate 30 lamella. Dao with ring pommel, length, 71 cm, Tang Dynasty The Dao was separated into four categories during the Tang Dynasty. These were the Ceremonial Dao, Defense Dao, Cross Dao, and Divided Dao. The Ceremonial Dao was a court item usually decorated with gold and silver. It was also known as the Imperial Sword. The Defense Dao does not have any specifications but its name is self-explanatory. The Cross Dao was a waste weapon worn on the belt, hence its older name, the Belt Dao. It was often carried as a sidearm by crossbowmen. The Divided Dao, also called a Long Dao, was a cross between a polearm and a saber. It consisted of a 91 cm blade fixed to a long 120 cm handle ending in an iron butt point although exceptionally large weapons reaching 3 meters in length and weighing 10. 2 kilograms have been mentioned. Divided Deos were wielded by elite Tang vanguard forces and used to spearhead attacks. In one army, there are 12,500 officers and men. 10,000 men in 8 sections bearing belt Deos, 
2,500 men in two sections with divided dais. Taibai Yinjing Jin Dynasty Iron Jiansom warriors and bandits dual wielded dais to break deadlocks in confined terrain during the late Song Dynasty. According to the Shuzi Ji Tong Jen Changbian, written in 1183, the horse beheading Dao was a two handed saber with a 93. 6 cm blade, 31. 2 cm hilt, and ring pommel. Chinese style Jian from the Mongol Empire era under the Yuan dynasty, the Jian experienced a resurgence and was used more often. Jurkin Swords Qing dynasty Jian with jade hilt the Dao continued to fill the role of the basic close combat weapon. The Jian fell out of favor again in the Ming era but saw limited use by a small number of armed specialists. It was otherwise known for its qualities as a marker of scholarly refinement. The horse beheading Dao was described in Ming sources as a 96 cm blade attached to a 128 cm shaft, essentially a glaive. It's speculated that the sweet Frederick Coit was talking about this weapon when he described young Chenggong's troops wielding with both hands a formidable battle sword fixed to a stick half the length of a man. Some were armed with bows and arrows hanging down their backs, others had nothing save a shield on the left arm and a good sword in the right hand, while many wielded with both hands a formidable battle sword fixed to a stick half the length of a man. Everyone was protected over the upper part of the body with a coat of iron scales, fitting below one another like the slates of a roof the arms and legs being left bare. This afforded complete protection from rifle bullets and yet left ample freedom to move, as those coats only reached down to the knees and were very flexible at all the joints. The archers formed Koshinga's best troops, and much depended on them, for even at a distance they contrived to handle their weapons, with so great skill that they very nearly eclipsed the riflemen. The shield bearers were used instead of cavalry. Every tenth man of them is a leader, who takes charge of, and presses his men on, to force themselves into the ranks of the enemy. With bent heads and their bodies hidden behind the shields, they try to break through the opposing ranks with such fury and dauntless courage as if each one had still a spare body left at home. They continually press onwards, notwithstanding many are shot down, not stopping to consider, but ever rushing forward like mad dogs, not even looking round to see whether they are followed by their comrades or not. Those with the sword sticks, called soap knives by the Hollanders, render the same service as our lancers in preventing all breaking through of the enemy, and in this way establishing perfect order in the ranks, but when the enemy has been thrown into disorder. The sword bearers follow this up with fearful massacre amongst the fugitives. Frederick Khoi Chi Higuang deployed his soldiers in a 12-man Mandarin duck formation, which consisted of four pikemen, two men carrying Deos with a great and small shield, two wolf brush wielders, a rearguard officer, and a porter. Thanks for watching.